construction uh, and design consultancies. We're based uh, in Melbourne, um, although we're now a bit more distributed thanks to COVID. Uh, and uh, the Academy is all about translating um, the knowledge of our consultants uh, and their experience uh, into practical learning opportunities. Uh, in addition to delivering courses like measurement, evaluation and learning, theory of change, data visualization and reporting, we also host webinars like these. A quick overview of how the webinar is going to run today. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce your panelists who you can see up there in the screen. Give us a wave. Um, and uh, once I've introduced them, we'll then open up uh, to a couple of questions that I have for them. And then after we've got the, the conversation going a bit uh, in the last kind of 20 to half, half an hour, um, we'll open up to questions from you all. Um, if you'd like a, a, a panelist to answer one of your questions, please make sure you type it into the Q&A box, which uh, you can access by clicking at the bottom of your screen on the button that says Q&A and type your question in there. Before you um, hit submit though, make sure that no one else has typed a similar question to you. If they have, you can just upvote it rather than repeating the question. And we'll make sure that the uh, questions that receive the most upvotes are the ones that get put to the panelists. In addition to that, some of you uh, have got ahead of the game already and have um, submitted some questions to us via registration form. And we'll also be making sure we get to those and cover them. There's also a chat panel, uh, which if you wanna have a more casual conversation with any of your fellow um, audience members, uh, or if there's something that you didn't quite understand that one of us said, just type a question or a, a comment into that chat panel uh, and I'll make sure I bring it to the attention of the panelists. Um, we are recording the session, as you can see in the top left-hand side of your screen. Uh, that's to ensure that uh, the people who weren't able to make it um, can receive the recording, which we'll be sending out uh, later on this week. So you'll get that in an email. With all of that housekeeping out of the way, it's now my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce our panelists for today. Joining me, we have Mark Kabaj and Jess Dart. So a little bit about Mark first. Mark is the president of a consulting company called From Here to There. And he's also an associate of Tamarack, which many of you will be familiar with, particularly if you live in North America. Um, Tamarack is a Canadian Institute for Community Engagement. Mark has deep experience in using evaluation in policy, philanthropy and activism, and has played a central role in promoting the emerging field of developmental evaluation. Welcome, Mark, and thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Cam. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jess. Hi, Mark. <laughs> so I have a, um, a question to help us get to know you a little bit better, Mark. Uh, what would you say is your evaluation superpower? <clears throat> oh, Lord, the superpower question. Uh, I have maybe have a Cam a super itch. Uh, the super itch is maybe this sort of relentless visceral urge to understand the nature of the complex situations we're trying to unravel. Uh, it's really like peeling away an onion and you peel away one layer and you get some insight and then you realize you have to peel away yet another layer. So it might be an urge more than anything. I don't know if it's a power. <laughs> and has that urge been with you your whole life or is that a, a later life thing or when did it develop? Yeah, well, you know, like, like you and probably everyone on this call, if we're interested in evaluation and learning, it's, I think, I think we all have that innate ability and it gets amplified if you jump into something complex and you realize we're not entirely clear how to deal with it. So the only option is to learn. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Uh, our second panelist today is uh, Dr. Jess Dart. And uh, Jess, as many of you will know, is the founder of Clear Horizon and also the creator of the Collaborative Outcomes Reporting Technique. She's also the co-author of the Most Significant Change uh, User Guide which we talked about in our webinar last week. Uh, for Jess, learning is truly at the heart of everything that she does. Welcome, Jess. Thanks, Cam. And yeah, same question for you. What's yeah. your evaluation superpower? Well, I was thinking about this, and isn't it the case that our strengths are often our biggest weaknesses and sort of like that? But one of the things that um, I used to think was a weakness, and now maybe I'm thinking it's a superpower, is that I'm a fiddler. Like I never stop fiddling with things. I never finish things because I always want to make them just a little bit better. And so I used to drive my staff absolutely nuts that I would write a training <laughs> course and then, oh, but I've got another, I've got another thing. Oh no, we, I've learned something else. I've got to add that in. Oh no, there's something else. And I'm constantly iterating. So I am a natural born iterator. 
uh, which I thought was fiddling and I thought was such a bad thing. And now I'm in fashion now and the, the world is so complex that we have to keep learning, don't we? So I never stop. It's not some, I, I, you can think of it as fiddling or you can think of it as constantly trying to improve things. Never, never finishing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It sounds like the world has caught up with you, maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So, um, as I said, thank you, everyone, uh, for sending through your responses in the registration form. Uh, we understand there's a pretty broad range of experience and knowledge in this area. Um, and so we're going to attempt to cover the basics and also move through into more intermediate and advanced areas. Um, and we also understand you have all really keen to um, hear some tangible real world examples. So I'll do my best to draw those out of the panelists today. Uh, and finally, um, yeah, I will get to the questions that some people have eagerly um, submitted already before the session, uh, before we open up to questions from people who are here today. So uh, without further ado, onto the questions. My first one is for Mark, and this one comes from one of our learners in the academy. Uh, mm -hmm. What is strategic learning and how is it different from regular learning? Well, I'm sure, Jess, you have your own version of that. I can remember when I first heard the term, I was actually doing uh, a survey of innovator, uh, developmental evaluators, uh, and I interviewed 18 of them under to do some work at uh, university, and I called it the uh, Reflections and Experiences of Developmental Evaluation Experiences of 18 Early Adopters. And uh, I, I connected with someone who, and I've forgotten his name, actually, who was at the Atlantic Philanthropies on the Eastern Seaboard of the U.S. And uh, he he raised this phrase strategic learning. And I, I actually, when I first heard it, I, I didn't think much of it. I thought, well, it's easy to put two words together and come with the con uh, with the concept. But as I, I listened to him a little bit more and then got uh, more of an understanding of what they were getting at, I realized it was something pretty special, I think, or, or unique and value added. And uh, it had a couple of features and I'll just read them out now. Uh, and as I share this, I'm, I'm channeling stuff from the Atlantic Philanthropies and the Foundation Strategy Group, FSG, and the Center for Evaluation Innovation have done more. And I, I know we'll give people those links. But here's a couple of features that I learned about. And then Jess, please riff on it, because I know you've got your own entry point into this. It is the strategic learning is the use of data and insights from a variety of information gathering approaches or sources of intelligence to inform strategy. So the emphasis is on strategy. Should uh, we put the slide up? Do, do you want to put the slide up, Mark? Oh, that's right. We have okay. a slide. Do yeah. you have a slide on your slide. end? Or would you like we me to? We have do? a slide so people can see the words. Yeah. Ralph, could you share the slide? Okay, so there it is. There we go. Second Terrific. next slide. Yeah. 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 Next one. Can move it on one. There. There, it is. there we go. Perfect. Well, so number one, it's about informing strategy, multiple sources of intelligence. Uh, it, it's not just gathering data. Jess, I think you and, and Cam, all of us know that you can gather data, but if you make don't make sense of it, right, it's just noise. So it's being systematic about being evaluative and learning about it. And it tries to, and Jess, I know this is one of your big insights, it, it tries uh, to integrate it in real time, not just a periodic piece of work. Uh, so it influences the process. It's not something we do later. It tries to say this is going to happen in real time. So, you know, to channel um, John Connie, he's got a great phrase. This isn't counterintuitive, but it is a little bit countercultural because I don't think we've been as thoughtful about learning as uh, we uh, have ought to have been in the past. So that has been my entry point to it. Uh, Cam or Jess, I don't know if you want to riff on that at all. Yeah, I mean, at a really simple level, Mark, a really simple, simple definition for me is that um, when people just talk about learning, you can learn about anything. So I guess when you mm -hmm. put the word strategic in it, you're talking about learning about the strategy of what you're doing, aren't you? I agree. So you, 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 however you learn from a variety of things to feed into the future direction of what you do. So it's yeah. learning, and, and we use theory of change a lot. So for me, it's often learning about the theory of change and, and what it needs to be. And so it, it sort of provides you with a forward navigation. Does it that does, make sense? Yeah. Just it's basically learning about what's working so you can improve it, isn't it? At a very basic level. I 100% yeah. agree, Jess. And you know, the, the one thing, however, I will say that got me sitting up straighter than I normally do is maybe it's on the next slide, we can touch on this and I wouldn't mind your, your reflections on this. This was important for me to hear as an evaluator 
uh, that it's it's unique in the sense that it really draws from multiple sources of intelligence. Yeah. And we're so used to saying, what does the evaluation tell you? And I think that's important. That's always part of the decision making pie. But listen, all when we're strategists, never mind when we're working with them, we know that's not the only way people draw information from. They, they they're drawing from everything. Cam, mm -hmm. you might have had an experience, a chat with one of your colleagues who gives you some intel about something, some insights. You read something from somewhere. So we're it, it widens Jess and Cam, I think, our gaze about the kinds of things informing thinking. And it says, don't just focus on the normal traditional evaluative feedback loops, widen our gaze to consider all the things that influence how we think and decide. And there's a wrestling too, isn't there, um, Mark? A wrestling with trying to get under the assumptions that we make. So instead of just you know listening to everybody or looking at the data and bring it together and deciding what to do there's a wrestling isn't there there's a sort yeah. of like why are we thinking like that what 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 led us to think this and oh I, I you know and really challenging each other's thinking as well so there's a there's a there's a tussle in it too isn't there there, there really well there is and there, there's actually maybe we can go to the next slide because i think what you're getting at jess is there's multiple levels uh, yeah the, the levels yeah 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 why don't you take a, a, a riff at this, Jess, because we both talked about it and we can talk, yeah. and we can just share how we played with it. Yeah, so this, you know, you've probably, a lot of you have heard about single and double loop learning, and it comes from the original work of Adjuris and Sean. I think it was, what was their original publication, Mark? It was back oh, in the 1990s. Jess, don't 1990s. embarrass me. I forgot the name, but I, I remember the authors. Yeah, it was the book. I remember reading it years ago. It was a book called Organizational Learning by Adjuris yeah. and Sean. That's where I first read it, and they've rewritten parts of it in various publications. Adjuris has been, Chris Adjuris has been writing about it. So you probably, a lot of people probably heard about single and double loop learning. And I guess yeah. it's the idea of single loop learning is sort of the most obvious sort of learning that we do. You know, we, 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 we do some activities, we see whether it works and, um, and you know, we might modify the dose or tweak things to get, to get better results. So I guess it's a bit like, continuous learning isn't it like people call continuous improvement don't they it's a bit like that and the example that Adjuris and Sean always use is of the thermostat so the thermostat has a fixed um a, a temperature range when it gets cold the heat and the blasts out more and it adjusts it adjusts to the environment but you're keeping the settings the same the policy is the same the theory of change is the same more or less you're just adjusting the dose and how much you put out and that's sort of the first loop of learning. The second loop of learning is going a whole lot further. It's sort of saying, well, maybe we don't need our air conditioner on at all. I mean, maybe let's put a jumper on or let's move house to somewhere warmer like Cam did. Cam is now living in Byron Bay, by the way, and it's really lovely and sunny there. So, you know, it's like a whole different idea about let's, let's not stay within the system with him. Let's completely challenge the way we're doing this and rethink the theory of change, come to a different theory of change. And it's much more disruptive and much more profound. And that's sort of the, the second loop. And you guys even talk about a triple loop, don't you? But we won't go too far into that today. Well, I, I won't except just to say, Jess and Cam, I know we, we want to get to the next question, but if people Google double, triple loop learning, single loop, on, you'll find a ton of stuff. Yes, the the of authors stuff, are in yeah. the sidebar. Uh, just, just to that point, we won't go into it, but yeah, we've mocked around with the idea of triple loop learning is about what are we learning about ourselves and how we are uh, our own behavior and even our, our psychological space working on, mm -hmm. on, on in this um, on a complex issue. We can come to that later, but it's a very useful way of distinguishing, as you wanted us to do, between different kinds of learning. Yeah, and the triple loop learning is a bit like the theory U. If people want to learn more about that, it's exactly. uh, theory U, isn't it? We can put yeah. links in there. Let's let's go on, shall we? So we could stop sharing the slides now, I think. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Jess and Mark. Um, so why is this important? And why is strategic learning, uh, what's all the fuss about? Yeah, well, we, Mark and I've been chatting about this. So we've got, uh, we think there are three key things, don't we, Mark, yeah. that we, um, that we, um, that really make, make it so important. And so the three things, I'll just outline them quickly and then Mark, maybe you can talk to them. So the three things is, is basically that, you know, we've got to sort of learn our way through change. And I'll leave you with that and Mark will come back to it. And the second thing is that success seems to begin with failure or gets powered by failure. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is that the reason why it's so critical and we have to do this is learnings have a bit of a half life. 
they don't they don't last forever. We have to keep doing it. So they're the three points. Do you want to elaborate on them, Mark? Yeah, thank you. Those are our three. And, and Jess, I think you and I would both channel Bertrand Russell, who says, I'm not willing to die for my beliefs because I might be wrong. These we think are pretty good opening three, but there might be better ways or yeah. other ways of, of doing it. But these seem to make sense for us. Mm. Uh, and to your first point, uh, you know, if you if to fall back on that kind of tried and true distinction between simple, complicated and complex, uh, again, simple issues, there's a recipe, find the recipe and implement it with high fidelity and you'll get an outcome. Complicated is don't bother, find the experts and give them time and they will probably do their homework and they will plan, they will get through it by planning and good execution. Complex issues say you actually can't understand, never mind make progress on an issue unless you interact with it. You might have some general insights from research and you've got your past experience, right? Uh, you know, using the metaphor of raising kids, you may have raised one kid, but it improves your ability to help raise a second one, but it doesn't mean you're, you're great at it. And so you actually have to interact with the problem. And I think we all have case studies about how most of our strategies are actually quite emergent and learning oriented. We learn by doing. You have an opening loop like a chess game, a hunch, a hypothesis, an opening set of activities. You get in there and then you just start learning and then you act, react, reflect and adapt. So action learning loops, we're all familiar with them. It's very hard, Jess, I think, and Cam, you would agree to, to imagine going into a complex issue without saying every time we make a move, we're, we we might learn something dramatically new about it. And it's just the fact, isn't it, Mark, that we don't know what the right thing is to do. That's the nature of it, isn't it? In these sort of complex settings, there is no recipe is to, to follow. So you just have to sort of like throw yourself in there and go, oh, maybe that wasn't the right thing. Let's take a step back. Let's try another step. Yeah, so it's definitely learning by doing as a, as a whole style of, of working, really. Yeah. Well, and it elevates your point earlier, Jess. If you look at traditional plan, the work and work, the plan modalities where discipline is coming up with the right plan and implementing with high fidelity, there's learning, but it's more about implementation, kind of single loop and self-correction. Complex. If we're complexity aware, we're always double and triple loop learning. So yeah. you can make progress on a problem without interacting with it. And you can interact with it, but if you're not systematically learning, you're probably not going to be that good. So we might as well commit to systematic learning. At the second point you mentioned, uh, Jess, and you and I chatted about this, and I think we touched on it earlier as well, Cam, that if you're intervening into a complex issue, failure is not occasional, it's endemic, mm. right? Uh, whether it's small failures or big failures, there's no way of, of not uh, having something not work out as you mm. plan. Sometimes mm. because, you know, it's a failure for which we might be a little bit ashamed of because we should have thought about that or we stopped, we didn't follow up with policy or procedure. Mostly it's because there's such a level of uncertainty that we're not going to make progress. We're constantly making corrections, both single, double, and triple loops. So, so we're going to, if we don't learn from failure, boy, oh boy. Uh, and you've talked about, don't you talk about it as a praiseworthy failure? It's a really nice concept. Absolutely, yeah. Well, Rather than blameworthy the, failure. Yeah, because you're trying you, something you know, that's worth trying. It's yeah. worth trying. There, there are so many people now who are familiar with these failure reports and, and uh, learn a fail forward that we, we can probably touch upon them at the very end of it. But, but failure is not an issue, but uh, that's not a problem, but uh, not learning from failure is a problem. Yeah, yeah, that, that yeah. is a problem, yeah. The, maybe the third one, just to touch on what you'd mentioned is that I, we, all, we both have different phrases for this, but uh, maybe not all learnings, but many, many, if not most learnings have uh, what some people would call uh, a strategic half-life, strategic decay, a short shelf life, or and you you said it nicely, learnings are not forever. Things move on us and mm -hmm. learnings are often temporary. So they're good, but if we don't use them quickly, they're gonna decay. And, and so we can't hold on to them forever. We can't say we learned something that is foreverly useful. We learned something that might be hyper useful right now. Mm -hmm. And then we gotta act on it. So Dan, you, you asked us to talk about the reasons for uh, doing strategic learning. There may be more, but we think those first three at least should be considered. And critical in the context of working in complexity and in working in this crazy world of pandemics and climate change and growing inequity where, you know, it just feels like there's there's so much to do and there's so much to learn. And this is a, a, a stance really, uh, having a learning stance is so critical in this time. Absolutely. Yeah. So can you give me a few examples of 
how you're each wrestling with this at the moment and what's been your journey mm. so far and, and what's really alive for you at the moment? Mm. Yeah, well, I guess I'm, I was beginning to say, I just think the world is, um, I, I mean, we're, I've been in my bedroom now for three months in lockdown in Melbourne, so I am going a little bit mad. So f- please forgive me, but it looks like I'm in this beautiful place tonight. This is, of course, a background and I'm in my bedroom. <laughs> It just feels like there's so much going on to address. The problems are getting more critical. Maybe we've done the easy stuff. I don't, I don't know what it is, but it feels like the work that we're getting asked to be involved in is more and more complex and challenging, and we need to step up. You know, we need, you need, we need evaluators need to step up into the fold and do this. And I guess what I've been wrestling with is in my career, like I'm, I'm an m and professional. Yeah, I have been for 20, 30 years. And there's a lot of m and people around the world. You know, when I look on LinkedIn, there's one group that has like 8,000 people who do m and you know, and they're all doing m and But when I look at what a lot of it is, it, it seems to be um, a lot more about compliance and accountability. Still, a lot of m and or uh, monitoring and evaluation is about accountability. So throughout my life, I've been trying to poke in learning. I've been trying to poke it in wherever I can. And we call it MEL, not m and For that reason, we say measurement, evaluation and learning. And I'm always trying to say, but it's a learning, like make sure you do the learning. And I keep going on and banging on about it. But I suppose what I've often done, um, the fault I've had is I've often said, make sure you do an annual reflection workshop. Make sure you get all your data together and actually look at it to use, to see what difference it's making and adjust your theory of change. And I've been saying that for a long time and it suddenly dawned on me, you know, that's not often enough. It's so obvious, isn't it? Annually is not often enough anymore. Imagine in COVID if you'd said, well, let's wait for a year and let's take the results together and then decide what to do with our business, you know? No way. It's got to be next week, hasn't it? It's got to be really much more regular. So I feel like the loops of learning, I'm wrestling with this idea that we've got to speed up, like evaluators have got to come to the party like designers do. We've got to speed up. We've got to get part of feed information much more quickly into Mm. learning in order to keep up with the amount of change going on. So that's what I'm wrestling with. Yeah. To play the devil's advocate there, Jess, uh, that would take an incredible amount of time though, right? Like it is, it's the ideal definitely, but with say, you know, project managers who are wrestling Mm. with multiple competing priorities, how do you carve out the space in your busy day to actually make that happen? Well, it is the work. I think it is the work that we should be doing. And if you're doing the wrong thing, you're wasting your time even more. So I think we have to reset and how that happens. But there are also techniques to make it quicker. Like we're learning from designers about rapid testing. Um, And like sometimes you have to sacrifice or rethink rigor so that you can do things more quickly. But, you know, using things like triangulation, triangles, that's good enough, make a decision, you know, just add a bit more rigor in on the moment. And things like dashboards, of course, they're visual, they're there, they're real time, look at that data too. So I think that there is technology and new ways of working that are allowing us to work faster. We can learn from the designers, they do it. So why, why, why shouldn't we? Yeah. Great, thanks Jess. And Mark, how about you? How are you currently wrestling with this challenge? Well, I like the phrase of, you know, speeding up. I, I was thinking, uh, something similar. I was thinking, I'm preoccupied with just catching up. Um, you know, I once joked that if evaluators had a hat, it would be, I'm their evaluator, which way did the social innovators go? I, I never feel we're even close to them. And I, mm. I think there's real problems, and I can see some of them in the chat room about the, the authorizing environment for learning and our systems, and I, I'm not diminishing that at all. But I think if we would just spend time with the change makers, uh, they do it all the time, and I, they would wish they wish for systematic learning. So I get my energy in my authorizing environment from them. And I can maybe just show, just share a very quick snippet that I've written about. So uh, I think in some, one of the pre-readings when we were evaluating a lab to address racism in my hometown of Edmonton, uh, uh, we actually did a, a pretty quick round, Jess, of prototyping and, and developing some pretty compelling prototypes. And then when, I, when we reflected on how good the prototypes were, people said, you know, they were pretty good, but they were quite incremental. They all got picked up, but none of them felt like game changers. And there was a lot of reasons for that. And we actually went through the triple loop learning, Jess. We had 11 tactical things we could have fixed in the lab. We had five strategic insights about racism in the strategy and the limitations of labs. But the biggest learning was, and this was their learning. I didn't bring this up. They, it revealed itself when we reflected is 
they said, we are too scared. We didn't create a room, a space where we could legitimately talk about racism because we were too scared and played Canadian nice, polite. The moment it got friction oriented, we backed off. And so we never got deep. You talked about theory U. We never went, we had a very shallow U. And so they said, next time, we have to create a space and we're gonna get really good at talking about race because if we don't, we're not gonna be within a thousand miles of transformational. Now, that, so there was profound triple loop learning. And again, I literally was keeping up, like they wanted to go there and it didn't take that long. That was uh, half a day of reflecting on a big project. And uh, we didn't find the problem of funders and managers uh, uh, at all because they were happy that someone was so honest about it. So my summary to your question, Cam, is, <laughs> I'm preoccupied with keeping up with people who wake up every moment thinking, I want to transform the world. And I, I, we, we have to keep up to them. It really sounds, Mark, like you're an activist at heart. I have a, I have a streak. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what tools have you found to be most useful in this area? We might start with, with you, Jess. Oh, we've got a slide for this as well, for those people who want to see. Uh, and Jess is, uh, Jess is a tool master, so I always like, Hearing just a summary of tools. <laughs> You're a tool master too as well, Mark. I think we, we <laughs> meet together. Uh, yeah, there's lots of tools out there. I guess um, one of the ones that I, um, I'll start with one that I'm finding is helpful for building muscle, if you like, to challenge assumptions. Because I, I think that we can all get better at learning how to challenge our assumptions. That's like what you just talked about is this assumption that we're you know, realizing that you're avoiding talking about racism is a classic, isn't it? It's classic, one of those mm -hmm. assumptions that are, you realize that you're, you've all been holding or you've been avoiding. Um, and so one of the methods that I like to use is um, this method of most significant learning. I can't see mm -hmm. anything on the screen. Is there, is it's a bit bl it's blank at the moment? Is that just me? No, it looks like it's all of us. I think, um, Rav, if you could bring up the slide. Um, Different this, slide, I think you're on the wrong screen, Rav. Yeah, well, no, we, we can, can do without that. that. We'll keep talking yeah. anyway. Yeah. But uh, most significant learning is this method. There it is. We got it now. Yeah. Most significant learning, that's the third one down, is uh, one that I we use. And it's like a, it, you know, you probably, you may know most significant change, which is the sort of like its sister, it's a sibling of that. But it's not right. about changes. It's about the most significant learning. And we, st we, we start the storytelling process off by asking, uh, think about all the assumptions that you were carrying at the beginning that are, don't seem to be holding true of those which is the most significant and what's going on so that people bury down quite quickly into something pretty deep there and then we ask them to tell a story of exactly what that assumption was at the beginning what changed and why it's significant and the beauty of that is we don't talk about what went wrong or failure and we, and we sort of elevate the, the fact that we, we are trying to bust assumptions and that's good you know and we sort of like trying to find that and we share those stories and we do that sometimes straight away at the beginning of a reflection it's the first thing we do it it builds muscle to start mm -hmm. to talk about things you can't talk about and get used to it and to talk about failure in a really sort of positive way so I find that is my fail safe method it's really easy if you want the the tools on our website um it's it's not a hard tool to use so that's one of my favorites um do you want to do you want to share something um from from there's a lot there do you want to should we take it in turns mark you go one well sure uh, maybe i'll just riff i i love i love everything that's a derivative of most significant change in general in fact just i i remember when i first met you i couldn't believe i was meeting because i i've used that tool so many times <laughs> and I, I didn't even have an image of who created it so it was pretty terrific uh, i also uh draw on I like the failure report stuff that I've seen. And um, there's a great organization called Fail Forward out of Toronto, one of many that's got a lot of practical tools. And I like it because um, it asks us to be systematic about how do you have the ability to spot a failure, number one. Number two, what are your, what's your machinery to understand the reason for the failure? Was it blameworthy or praiseworthy, to use your earlier reference? Number three, how do you respond to it in real time? And number four, how do you then back up and, and try and make sure it doesn't happen again? And so there's lots of those things. And uh, we actually did it not long ago with the government of Alberta and everyone argued that we couldn't do a failure report because we were a public agency. No one was gonna to admit to that, but they did agree to do an internal failure memo. So it had the same machinery, but it was just for them. So 
there's lots of ways of taking basic ideas and applying them and adapting them in different ways. So I really like the failure report, which is similar in a sense to post -defense. Yeah, it is. I mean, I guess it's, yeah, it, the, the MSLs are shorter versions of that, aren't they? They're getting to the same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I am... Um, I, I'll go to the fifth one, which is theory of change. So we're really loving using a different type of theory of change, um, which is sort of, we start with a big, fat, loose, messy one. I call it a global theory of change. And we don't prioritize. It's fascinating. We just put everything that we think needs to change to solve the problem, regardless of how much money or who's doing what. And then we sort of work on that. Every time we do insights, we sort of go back to it and fix it up and go back to it and fix it up. And the beauty of it is it's got no scope. It's like breaking all the rules because normally we're really tight with our theory. Oh no, that's out of our field. But with a global one, nothing's out of scope. So the idea is to really, it's like a system theory of change, like what needs to change in the system rather than what we can influence or not. It's got everything there and it serves as a bit of a canvas and we iterate and then we drill in and we, we check out a bit and we develop a prototype on it. But we always have that big one up there so we don't get lost because sometimes I think we can lose focus on the outcomes a little bit when we're exactly. diving in. Because what, you know, when you prototype things, you often prototype a tiny thing and you forget how does it relate to the big outcomes, the mission mm -hmm. outcomes we want? So I'm loving using theory of change to really challenge. Um, it's very, very iterative, like many versions. Uh, yeah. It's not the way you would normally use it, but yeah, so an yeah, old it's, tool in a, used it's in a, a strategic, new strategic. You, you've just elevated it into a strategic thinking and learning tool. It was meant to be a planning tool, and now that's great, Jess. Oh, we love doing that. Yeah, so that's one of my faves. What about what about you? What about well, um, I'll be a, I'll be a cover band for some people that I really admire. In fact, I don't even know who really did this, so I don't know who I'm covering here. But uh, <laughs> I read about it in the Foundation Review, which is uh, a magazine which is online. It's for philanthropies in the U.S. There's a lot of good thinking there, and they've got really good, uh, really good articles. They're all free, and I started learning about this general concept of an emergent learning platform which if you Google Q4P, you'll see it come up and they've got a lot of the tools there. But what I love about it, Jess, and you were speaking about designers earlier, they acknowledge that sometimes you wanna learn something and it's not retrospective, you wanna learn, you wanna learn forward with it. And they say, take your learning question, like how might we, uh, with a how might we framing, mm -hmm. how might we uh, balance the urge for heavy consultation, engagement, and inclusion with this inordinate pressure of getting something done and a product out and some results, early results? Or, or how might we better understand the systems that hold unemployment in place for the, a specific group of people? So they, they ask you, frame your question, and then they give you all these different processes and tools to learn forward really systematically. So they say, what's your hunch? What are the opportunities to learn? How are you gonna make sense of that data? And then how are you gonna answer so what now what? So this little link here, Emergent Learning Platform, Q4P's got a bunch of them there. But what I really like they've, do, they've done is they've sensitized and normalized the idea that you can actually learn forward, not just retrospectively. And the, 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 it's the Foundation Review is the magazine that, that mm -hmm. uh, I first came across this concept from. Right, and we've got Leanne's put the link to that into the chat. So if you want to Thanks. follow up that, you can get it there. Thank you. I suppose link to that is just using agile methodology. I've got 90 day retros and sprints. It's yeah. like evaluators is often don't use the agile methodology and lots of people being trained in it. But this idea is of time boxing, you know, time box and like just um, work out what you're going to do for the next 90 days and then, you know, look to see whether it worked and what you're going to do next. Exactly. And getting disciplined about packaging it small in smaller packages. I, I actually think that's really helpful for strategic it learning, is. especially the systematic use of retrospectives, looking back and then looking forward. And like, yeah. I think that's, you know, and this, that's, this is from obviously from, from uh, design and uh, tech yeah. methodology. Oh, we've mm. got a different thing there. <laughs> Well, we're learning a lot, Jess. I mean, I think you've said a couple of times, I agree. I, we're learning lots from designers uh, yeah. about how to design processes, about how to design processes that are appropriate for the people we're trying to support. I, I really love the integration of design thinking across mm. the evaluation field. It's, it's made us better and could make us even more better, I think. Yeah, and we, we're obviously learning a lot from designers, aren't we? A lot of these things are integrated with design. 
What yeah, else? Absolutely. What else? And what about the inquiry questions? Because you know, as evaluators, Clear Horizon for years and years and years, we've like developed a set of evaluation questions, and we're finding it really liberating to sort of not do evaluation questions to do what we call inquiry questions instead because they don't all have to be evaluative some of them may be but some of them are more uh, speculative or more about research or more about the current situation or more, and it's yeah. sort of a bit liberal I'm finding it quite liberating uh, to have inquiry questions rather than uh, key evaluation questions how about you yeah no I agree all all learning begins with questions uh, good questions, and uh, I think in design thinking and emerging lab platform, platforms, all of them begin their inquiry framework with settling on a certain type of question. I agree. Mm. Is that enough on tools? Do we have any more to reckon, do? Yeah, let's move yeah. on. Let's thanks, stop so sharing. Okay, thanks, Ralph. Yeah. So many great resources uh, to access there, and again, we'll be sharing the slides uh, in the email so you can check in there um, in your own time. Um, Another question here, just want to keep our responses uh, fairly short to this one if we can. What are some implications for us as practitioners uh, that we need to grapple with? Uh, and if you can give examples of how you've done that, that would be great too. Maybe Mark, yeah. can start? Yeah, there? I'll start with the first one because we, we've talked a bit about this. Uh, this, I'm spending a, a lot of time on this. In fact, my last trip to Australia, or two years ago, I think, uh, Jess, or maybe it was last, or two years ago, you and I had a chat and I, I thought about it even more. I think what we have to do is, uh, one of the things we have to do is try to reframe learning, not as a spin-off, but as a central accountability of evaluation. And, and so the idea that uh, learning uh, data-informed decision-making and adaptation is an accountability. Mm -hmm. We've got to be really good at database, uh, gathering data, answering questions, making sense of it, and then showing that we adapt. And it's unaccountable for us not to do that. And in fact, one of the ironies is it's the only thing we really control in complex change initiatives, our learning. Really, yeah. It's harder to yeah. control system, system changes or impacts. So the thing we control most is something we should be most for, for which we should be most accountable. And I won't, I won't belabor that point, but if people are interested in a group that has tried to do it, the Blandon Community Foundation in St. Paul, Minnesota, I think it's St. Paul, Minnesota, they have this thing called the mountain of accountability. Mm. And at the basic level is accountability for good managerial processes. So Cam, let's say, and Jess, we got a grant, you know, are, we're not, you know, divesting the funds or using them inappropriately, etc. Accountability for tracking and reporting on results, whatever they are. And the highest form of accountability is learning development and adaptation mm -hmm. of our strategy. So people are already doing it. I think we, we really have to do it if we're dealing with complex social problems. So that's something I think we have to do. Uh, Jess, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think this this thing, at a really basic level of thinking that learning happens once a year, you know, and you have a structured plan and you follow that plan. You know, evaluators love their plans, don't they? I mean, I grew up building these big evaluation plans that are then executed over like three years and maybe, yeah, sure, refine them. But, you know, you, you've pretty much got a roadmap that you, so you have one plan and then each year you reflect and you learn and you write a report. That's just not okay anymore. <laughs> we can't do that anymore. We we have to like we have to sort of plan in smaller packets and, and be willing to let go and and really bring learning more into the everyday week to week, month to month. But to really bring it in. Um, and 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 the great thing is you get more results when you do this. Yeah. Get more impact. You know. So that's why we need to do it. Is because got a chance of making a difference at a time when there's lots of difference that needs to be made. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So real. So make it a, an accountability. Uh, number two, do it in real time. Uh, and, and the third one, Jess, that you and I discussed, uh, I think this one's tough. So let's just say the why of this is clear. The how of it is not. Mm. I'm not. I think we have to really be thoughtful about what we mean by rigor in learning, because, you I know, we all have yeah. biases. Evaluation is meant to help us control our biases or uh, offset them a bit when we talk mm -hmm. about outcomes, but I don't know about you. I've watched myself. I have my own way biases around what is a learning. Am, am I simply observing something in a way that says, I already believe that and here's more data or mm -hmm. that anecdote doesn't fit with my worldview, so I'm gonna ignore it. So, mm -hmm. I, and so if you're doing it in real time where the stakes yeah. can be quite high, 
there's something about fit for purpose rigor or fit for stakes and it's uh it's clumsy it's fuzzy but it doesn't diminish my concern about it that nice. we've got to be thoughtful about what that means we can't we can't do like a nasa led study but neither do we want to be flippant and just say we learned that well how do you know you learned that is there another way of looking at that would someone interpret a different learning so i, I think we've got to be that's a frontier that we should be brave about and brave and like we have to go into it as evaluators don't we like yeah. Mark and I are evaluators and like if we're going to do this real-time stuff we can't abandon the idea of evidence we're not abandoning it but we're rethinking it a bit to make it yeah. fit for purpose and what yeah. can we bring in to make it as rigorous as possible in that time for that purpose exactly. and yeah and I think we're all going to have to evaluate as they're really going to have to think about this so you're right it's a huge yeah. tension and it's but it's our tension isn't it it's time for us to come to the table with, with really thinking about this yeah I agree. Yep. Mm. Thank you both. I, I didn't, we may not have time for it, but just um, is there an example where you feel like you've elegantly resolved that tension? Ah, uh, gosh. I, well, I, I'll tell you an example. But I, my favourite example that I'm going to rave about at the moment is I'm working um, on a, a long term. It's actually a 10 year project. How often do you get them? It's a 10 year project. And it's community-led design in South Australia. It's our town funded by Faith Fuller Foundation. And we're working with um, Taxi. So the Australian Centre for Social Innovation are leading the implementation and we're doing the evaluation. And we're all part of one team and we're constantly throwing stuff around, got really highly functional meetings and constantly trying to work out how to reframe it so that it's community-led and, and we're in that transition phase. So I'd the way that is and it feels like i'm cracking it in a way that i don't normally on that one um and a part of it is um it's sort of just being very present in a way it's like rocking up as a as a person as well as an evaluator and being part of that team and waiting to work out what the right piece of evidence is and then pulling it together but at the same time obsessively documenting everything. I obsessively document everything. And whenever I get the chance, oh, should we do a little survey on that? Should I collect some notes on that? Can I do a debrief and record that? And I just try and catch everything. I try and catch it all from multiple perspectives. If nothing else, triangulation, just doing it from more than one perspective, a very basic Evaluators know this is a really basic tool, but I just try and make sure that I'm not just taking one source of evidence. And then I bring it together in little reports all the time on PowerPoint. I don't spend too long on them. We don't spend too long on them. We just throw them together. And we've, you know, in a year, there's been four little mini evaluations done. Every phase has a mini evaluation and we pull out the learnings and we return to the learnings and we keep holding a line of sight to the purpose and to the learnings. And Actually, what's been really helpful is a simple set of principles that we keep going back to. And we're checking in on our principles to see if we're holding ourselves to them. And that seems to, so it's a simple framework, simple methodology, grab everything, con write obsessively. That's my tool. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. Not very sophisticated, but it seems to be working. It's <laughs> great. And how about you, Mark? Uh, you know, maybe I can just tell you where, not how I'm resolving it, but where I feel it most, uh, where I'm most uncomfortable. I, I'm by instinct uh, interested in social change and social justice. And I also find in those spheres and spaces for a bunch of understandable reasons, when we lock into a particular ideology or critical framework, it becomes rigid and narrow and you know, there's a phrase I read in a book when it's not that some of that analysis from whatever angle, race, gender, class, etc., is not insightful. I, I grew up with that. So it's not entirely wrong. It's just often not entirely right. And so I, I feel a real conflict in those instances to embrace all the truthfulness that comes out of that, but also yeah. to point out all the stuff that we might be missing. And it's because these issues are emotional and there's real pain, etc. I I'm constantly on edge about my role as an evaluator as someone who's supposed to be a critical friend to change makers and be sensitive about that, but not knowing where the line is most of the time, always trying to find it. Mm. Mm. It's not quite so clear anymore, is it? The line. But, yeah, and you know, I'm, most stuff is messy and in a complex world, it's hard not to be a rabid pluralist. Um, 
with these things. But I, I know I that's where I'm consumed by Cam. I, I really I don't have an answer. I just know that I'm really on edge in those situations because I'm trying to do the right thing. You're living into the question like you described before. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you both. Um, we have a, a, a question here from Mary that follows on from what you were saying, Jess. So I just want to get to that now. Um, can you give a couple of examples of principles that you return to in your work with taxi? Yeah, so um, we have a theory where we've got a very loose theory of change, but we, we didn't want to do a theory of change too early. Um, so we really try, we've got 10 years and we're at the beginning. So we're, it's, it's a practice in slowing down a bit at a level for me. So I'm like, you don't have to do everything at once. So, okay, what do we need at the beginning? So what we developed at the beginning rather than a thorough theory of change was a set of principles, six principles that define what the initiative is. And it's things like community led and trauma informed work and systems perspective, things like that. And we, what we do is we just keep, they're the, like the, the anchor in everything we do. And we come back to them as an evaluator, I can come back and have we applied this principle in this situation? Have we done that sufficiently? And we keep coming back to them. And they've been like that while everything else is wild and chaotic in the washing machine of, of working it out what we're doing, it's been the one constant and we haven't fiddled with, we've, we've got six and one and we've changed one slightly and that's it. And everything else has changed, but the principles have stayed the same. The beautiful thing about principles is that very durable. So in massive change, if you can get yourself a good set of principles, you evaluate yourself against them, you evaluate everything against them. It can, it's the one bit of solid ground early on. I find it really helpful. That's of course, based on principles focused evaluation which is Michael Patton's work. If you haven't come across it, it's really helpful in this sort of work, isn't it, uh, Mark? So, yeah. Something to hold fast to in the rough seas of change. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, well, we might move on to some questions that we received um, from the audience before the session. Uh, who should be involved in strategic learning? Who should we bring into this? Can we go first, Mark? Go. Oh, you know the answer. It depends. <laughs> that's what I was going to say too. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's where I want to bring in design thinking again, which again has been just being more explicit what I think is something we all know. Every evaluation is a unique storyline about who are the primary users. In fact, uh, I, I have this little uh, five minute video of micro lending in New York City and it's a little story we're all familiar with micro lending, how Mohammed you just tried to uh, replicate it in, in North America and Australia as well. And it's a little five minute video done by a journalist. And I actually asked groups to say, uh, who, uh, how would you evaluate this micro lending project? And people just go crazy, right? So you can have eight tables of eight, 64 people, uh, eight teams coming up with questions and indicators and methods, et cetera. And then I let them go for a while. And then I say, I, I apologize, but I sent you on a fool's errand. And the fool's errand was, I said, we don't know who the primary user was, what their questions are, do they have preferences for how the data is gathered, analyzed, or delivered? What are their windows of use? And I said, is it Mohammed Yunus who's desperately wondering whether you can rep legitimately replicate this to a different context? Is it the Ford Foundation who might be funding this and wants impact evaluation now on poverty? Is it the local administrator who's wondering how come people don't come on Thursdays uh, and, and I can't get enough people on the weekend and it's more formative? A design orientation, which you've been speaking about, says who and utilization focus, Jess. We've always talked about this. Yeah. Who should do the strategic learning? That's to be sorted out at the beginning. Who are the primary users? It might be an elite senior executive driven process, it might be a neighborhood participatory process. That question is answered on a case by case basis, and design thinking can help sharpen our 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 understanding of that. And it can change as well, can't it? Like like sure. we're doing this 10 year journey. And at the beginning, yeah. we're only selecting towns at the beginning. So we can't include all the towns because we haven't worked yeah. out who they are. So it's yeah. going to start with a smaller group um, and we can have a steering committee with, with lived experience on it. But as, as, as the, the towns start their work, that it's going to be in the community that are going to be doing yeah. the strategic learning, but it's going to change. So I think it, it can be at different times, different people, but it's certainly a group sport. Let's be clear about that. It is a group sport. It's not something that an evaluator does on their own, is it? Yeah. It's not that. Yeah, you can only win in a group on that one. You can't win that game on your own. No. Mm. no. Great. So what are the common mistakes people often make when they try applying strategic learning in MEL? 
In Mel, I would say the common mistake is that they don't do it at all. I know this sounds... <laughs> I just see so many people, I've seen so many people focused on the indicators and collecting the data and writing a report to a funder, to a donor, and like never thinking that they might use that data for themselves. This is the first crime, is not using the data at all. <laughs> just thinking that it's for reporting. I, I still reckon 80% of organisations are doing that. They're just um, collecting data to fuel an accountability mechanism because they have to and not actually stopping and looking at it. So the first thing is to stop and look at your data and draw out the insights yourself. That's the first step. So, and when, when people do that, they don't do it often enough. Mm -hmm. um, and they get sort of locked up in where, and I think they let planning take too long. I, this is my mistake, look. I remember the first time I did um, a big developmental evaluation. I wrote this massive plan and then there was a pivot in the project and I rewrote it. And then there's another pivot and I rewrote it. And I, I used all my budget writing the plan. Because <laughs> I rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it and there's nothing left. And what a shame. What a terrible mm -hmm. crime. Don't do that. I haven't done that since. Well, Jeff, this might be where the real-time nature that you're advocating that seems to be in, uh, a necessary part of strategic learning might help uh, address a common mistake. Because I was going to say the same thing. I think people often talk about, well, what was learned, but not the so what, now what, mm. right? And so you would often say, here's a lesson, learn, and we go, well, what's the demonstration that's actually been learned? Yes. Right? So, uh, so that's a question. But if, if it's real-time, it's, it's harder to simply crank out a learning zone and keep going. You're kind of compelled in real time to say, well, I learned that and is the decision don't do anything or is it fix up, don't have meetings on Thursday? What's the, <laughs> or what's the it, action, yeah. Or is it a big thing? So I think the real time nature and if you add a so what now what we could, we could probably address a lot of your concerns about, you know, it just being a credentialized process. Yeah, getting to the action, but also writing it down. I also see some people getting to action and going really, really fast and not writing things down. And you actually forget the learnings because there's so many, they pile up quite, quite high, don't they? And the actions and you can get like really, oh my God, like, what do we learn? I can't remember. There's been so many things we learned. We got so much wrong. And like, if you can remember to write down the critical moments, I do think that helps to cement the learning. Absolutely. And we, in our team, um, we reflect weekly in retros and we wow. take the things, our learnings, yeah, and we convert do. them into actions and we take the actions and put them into our Trello board for that week of work. Obsessive so, documentation, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Well, you know, that's sort so of interesting, that you can that practice, because uh, the International Development Research Corporation used to be uh, out of Ottawa. They, they did some work and they found out that the most the greatest amount of learning happens within the first 25 to 33 percent of a project because mm -hmm. this is where to your point just assumptions are tested right yeah. and then things for mechanical reasons maybe because of the funding things start to converge and get more mm -hmm. level one a, a single because the big ones happen doesn't mean they can't adapt but there's sort of a tendency to do it and there's also this other pro dynamic called i think it's called confabulation where Cam, let's say you did that learning, but at one point you've internalized it and you think you always knew it, when in fact you didn't. That, but you've just, mm -hmm. you're now, it's so routinized that you knew it. So it's also an accountability thing saying, here's what we learned and here's what we did. We're being accountable to a learning and an adaptation. But if you wait to the very end, as you warned us not to do just, you actually forget that because you think you always knew it and you didn't document why you changed and you, you really mm -hmm. diminish how powerful the learning was early on. So there's another case for documenting. But you have to be careful not Absolutely. to get overwhelmed and try and write every every breath. Sometimes I go too far that way as well. <laughs> there is a balance to be had, like, um, yeah. Definitely. A middle ground to be found. Mm -hmm. um, so opening up to some questions we've had in the last uh, hour, on Jess's point about m and &E being very compliance and accountability focused mm -hmm. rather than strategic learning focused, what tips uh, would you give to, to people working in internal evaluation roles to shift that narrative? I think if you've never used agile methodology and you've never tried these these 90 day cycles and like and, and doing a, a, a absolute disciplined uh, at least uh, learning and reflection and thinking back and trying to bring some evidence to that I think that can make a huge difference and trying some of MSL most significant learning or, or, a, or a learning report um, or what do we call failure report things like that actually writing down what you've learned I think that there are little steps forward uh, there's some great tools and things that Mark shared with us as well. What, what would you say? What's in, as an internal evaluator, 
what would you start doing, Mark? Yeah, I, I have some bad habits, guys. So I'm going to give you one of my bad habits. It's, it's maybe not a bad habit. It's an assumption. I, I tend to look at compliance stuff as feeding the beast. Mm. Uh, like, uh, and saying, I have to do this. There's, a, there's a, a reason for doing it. And I try and saying, what can I do to do it without getting overwhelmed? Right? But concurrently to that, I think, but I mostly got to save as much good energy and creativity for my own learning. And so if I could do that, and we are systematic about that, we might simply have no problem fulfilling the credentialized reporting requirements, but without diminishing ourselves. So I like to think, what do we want to learn first? And more often than not, that addresses and exceeds whatever the accountability, but I never start with the accountability requirements. No, I, I say the same thing. I often say, focus on your own, own learning needs first. Focus right. on what you want to learn, what you need yeah. to manage this. And you know, the thing is, it's normally more than what the funders want. So you've normally covered it off anyway. So I try and use the driver as the learning of the team. Like what evidence do you need to, to actually do a really good job and to move forward? And if you collect that evidence and do it systematically, I find that you've all, nearly always met other people's needs because you need more. You actually need right. more data than they do. So, yeah. and then negotiate. The thing about funders is they often pull indicators out uh, from random places <laughs> because they're not really sure how to measure yeah. things. And if yeah. you find a yeah. better way, tell them. Yeah, engage your funders. Oh, in, engage, I found it really, really yeah. successful over time to engage with funders, not assume that they know any more and they're often no less because they're not engaged in the, in the actual work. And exactly. if you can come up with a better method, tell them, tell them what that might yeah. be. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you both. Uh, time for one last question. Um, this one comes from Myrna. Uh, she operates with teams that are often quite stretched out within with project or program related implementation tasks. What would help to integrate either through key elements or progressively strategic learning into the program evaluation strategy? So what would help integrate strategic learning into their evaluation strategy? It's, if they're quite dispersed and they're quite busy, I remember a few times I've had um, worked with teams who were very busy and quite dispersed and not connecting. And the one time that they did connect was around the evaluation. And I realized that uh, getting together to do strategic, strategic learning moments, like a monthly reflection, can actually bring a team together, a diverse team. It can be the glue, actually. So it's really worth trying to invest in. I think that people often complain they don't have enough time. You, we hear that all the time, don't we? You can't do it because we don't have enough time. I remember when I did MSC, you know, when I first started using MSC, I'd explain it and people would say, no, we can't, it takes too long, we can't do it. And once they started to use it, I remember going back a year later and saying, you know, you said it took too long, how is that now? And they're like, no, I didn't say that. It's just part of what we do. We just do it for an hour before we meet, you know, on, on Tuesdays, this is just how we work. And I'm like, oh, you changed your mind, didn't you? So I think if you can make it like part of work, part of normal, the core yeah. part of what you do, people don't question the time actually, yeah. because it makes your work more efficient. So why wouldn't you do it? I think you've got it. Anything you wanted to add there, Mark, in the next 10 seconds? Oh, I, I agree, make it seamless. And you know, I might play a language game and just say, it's not evaluation, it's strategy. And if you have no time for strategy, yeah, don't call I, I would evaluation. Make it a strategy function saying how how else are we going to do it? But I think that's I'd be willing right. to market it that way. Yeah, we should yeah, I, good I, sometimes think piece. we should rename our, what what we do completely at Clean Horizon and stop calling it evaluation. And then yeah, call it strategy work because that's really what it is. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for your time and your invaluable input. Um, really appreciate you giving up uh, an hour of your time to, to be with us today. Um, and also thank you to all of our audience to, for coming along. Um, we will be sending out a recording of this uh, to all of you very soon. I also want to flag just before we finish up that we do have a couple of learning opportunities at the Academy that are really aligned to the topic of today. Um, our flagship course, Measurement, Evaluation and Learning, commences in February. Uh, and one of the modules is specifically dedicated to strategic learning. And you can sign up for that independently or for the full course. We're also running a uh, evaluation, evaluating systems change and place-based um, approaches course next year as well. Um, so the links to both of those courses will be in the email um, and we'd love to see you in one of those courses, if not at another webinar coming up soon. Thank you all and uh, have a great day or evening or wherever, whatever time it might be. Um, and uh, we'll see you back at one of these. Thank things. you, Cam, for holding it so nicely. Thanks. That was great.